thank you very much. It's a, oh, I can't see anything at all. That's interesting. Um, it's really, really wonderful to be here. Th thank you very, very much to everyone involved in organising for um, for putting on such a great conference and uh, to the uh, previous two speakers for giving me quite a... Um, uh, quite a high bar to, uh, to, to follow and to, to end with. Now, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to read from, I guess, I guess the convention is to call it a paper at these things, but it's more of it. It's an essay I uh, wrote and published uh, in uh, October. It's uh, up at the Baffler magazine, if you want to if, if you want to look at it, um, uh, Fear of a Feminist Future, and uh, from notes from that, but expanding on that, uh, because that was written in um, what already feels like a slightly different historical moment and um, I'd like to follow up some of the things that Tasha said as well um, because it was a really really important talk so anyway um, this is a, a collection of ideas about the weaponization of the imagination and uh, the um, quote I wrote down from Tasha just now was um, imagining oneself in the future creates agency and that's absolutely true and I think it is important to understand when we think about science fiction we think about politics as science fiction just who gets to create that agency and what the tensions are there okay so to imagine the future is a political practice which means it's both strangely awful and awfully strange in 1990 a team of scientists and researchers were given the task of mapping far future scenarios for the disposal of nuclear waste. The dilemma was how to design an early warning system to make sure that humans in 20 centuries time don't dig in the wrong place and kill the world. As part of the report, a group of academics, all of them men, came up with a set of generic scenarios for how these future humans might live. And the most terrifying scenario was a feminist world. And um, I'm going to read it to you. Um, according to this bizarre piece of nuclear science fan fiction, in the feminist world, which was reached in the year 2091, 100 years in the future, okay, this is what they wrote. It's brilliant. And th th there are illustrations with this as well, which I, I really encourage you to, to look up. Um, Women dominated in society numerically through the choice of having girl babies and socially. Extreme feminist values and perspectives also dominated. 20th century science was discredited as misguided male aggressive epistemological arrogance. The feminist alternative Potash Corporation began mining in the WIPP site. Although the miners saw the markers, they dismissed the warnings as another example of inferior, inadequate and muddled masculine thinking. So they saw the signs saying, don't dig here, that, like men in the future wrote this, so we're going to dig here anyway, because fuck men. Um, and the world dies because women don't listen to men. Um, <laughs> it goes on to describe how extreme feminists reject the entire concept of knowledge as masculine and instead they put values and practices of attention to the feelings and emotions of particular individuals dooming the world in the process. All right, so why is it that mainstream culture is either afraid of a feminist future, a world where women have equal powers at all levels of politics and society, a world beyond the violent stereotypes that squash all of us into narrow boxes of behavior and strangle our selfhood, or unable to envision it at all? The types of future we can conceive of say a great deal about the limits of our political imagination, from the alt-right hate sites and hysterical pulp novels to revered works of literature, male visions of a post-collapse civilization have traditionally fallen along two lines. A cozy wild west where men can be real men, or a living nightmare where dangerously overconfident females have ruined everything after someone let them out of the kitchen long enough to think they deserved power. All right. Frederick Jameson famously observed that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, and that was the slogan that ricocheted around the left in the early years of the Great Recession. In fact, however, the two are linked. Capitalist patriarchy has always justified its own existence by insisting that there is no alternative but chaos, destruction, the end of civilization as we know it. The explosion of dystopian literature in recent years emerges from our ability to imagine the end of capitalism without also imagining the end of the world. And for many readers and writers, that comes with a curious sense of relief. 
It has become commonplace to speak of a modern crisis in masculinity, often when we're trying to avoid talking about the broader crisis of capitalism. And you actually see this throughout history when there have been economic and social crises. There's always been, you know, the end of men, the crisis in masculinity. This happened in the 1930s. It happened in the early 1900s. You know, the end of men are not real men anymore. And actually, it's a way of talking about economics without talking about economics. According to this man session theory, the rise of feminism combined with the collapse in the job market means that men can no longer be certain of their role as providers and husbands, and they begin to feel irrelevant. Apocalyptic dystopia plays directly into that sense of irrelevance, comforting men with the assurance that they will always be useful in a world that needs them to rebuild it. Dystopia offers a fantasy of those very aspects of masculinity that feminists supposedly condemn, becoming crucial in a scenario in which you must not get torn apart by raiders from the bunker next door. And for the alt-right imaginary, that means traditional patriarchy of the sort that only ever really existed in myth. A core idea behind this logic is that since female enfranchisement is a relatively late development, it therefore counts alongside nylon stockings and air conditioning as one of those modern luxuries that will have to be done without in post-civilization. Feminism to the conservative imagination is a modern indulgence, one of many trivial trivialities to be cast by the wayside like a child's empty doll on a nuclear battlefield. This suspicion is not limited to the frothing neocon contingent. You can find doomsayers on the left discussing women's liberation and anti-racism as bourgeois deviations that will disappear after the revolution, along with all other inconveniences of emasculating capitalism. Over at the Return of Kings, a fascinating website, um, an alt-right discussion hub and steaming compost heap of the sort of diatribes that pass for serious philosophy in the less hinged corners of the conservative internet. A writer called Corey Savage tells us four reasons why collapse will be the best thing to happen for men. I'm going to read some of these to you too because they're brilliant. Um, <clears throat> the collapse will mean the restoration of natural order, the rule of the jungle. One of the best aspects of the new order would be the return of masculine virtue. Only an organized group of men with strength, courage, mastery, and honor would prevail in the post-apocalyptic post world. Men will be men again. America will be great again. Um, who knows what savage energy is begging to be unleashed within that man serving as an office drone? And guess what? There won't be feminist harpies demanding equality when strong men are needed to rebuild civilizations and again defend against gangs and rival tribes. They'll be begging for some of that toxic masculinity to come and protect them. They'll kneel in submission to a patriarchal order faster than, faster than they would have screamed rape in a previous world. The unstable and fat ones will likely disappear first, as they offer no value to anyone. Just going to leave that for a second. All right. All right. So for all its toenail chewing bigotry, there is something poignant, actually, about this sort of yearning for a turn to a world that never was, where, you know, the office worker can live his dream of dominance by kicking all the fat chicks out of the compound. So no wonder the impending collapse of this degenerate world of gender quotas and rape alarms is a core part of the new right narrative, the brotopia is a consoling, familiar fantasy, in, the, in particular for those for whom the promise of modern masculinity never paid off. A desolate wasteland bristling with bandits you have to, have to fight to survive might involve more dis physical discomfort than a feminist future, but it's far more emotionally comforting. And there we return to, you know, Atasha's idea about imagining oneself in the future creates agency, and these people feel that agency has been taken away for th from them, and so they're imagining a future in which they have agency again in this odd way, you know, and, but it's also, a, it's, it's, a, it's both a sad and a, and a frightening future because it doesn't involve the creation of something new. It involves collapse as an inherent part of it. So you can only see yourself in a world where everything has fallen apart. It's limited in terms of its imagination because as we've seen with so much politics driven by white pat patriarchal rage and resentment, if you can't imagine a future in which you can live, the only thing you can count is what you've lost or what you feel you've lost. All right, the dystopian fantasies that 
attract many alt writers are ones in which they finally get to be the hero on terms they recognize. The rugged frontiersmen battling gamely against a world gone rotten with women back in their proper places as helpmeets, homesteaders, and occasional tragic victims so that our heroes can have something to cry about in chapter four. Okay, a future shaped at least in part by women poses such a profound identity threat as to be unthinkable to many ordinary Joes. A few brave truth sayers, however, have attempted to warn their fellow men about the coming gyne apocalypse. Writers like Parley J. Cooper in his, prophet in his prophetic 1971 book, The Feminists. I'm gonna read this to you as well. This is just the back cover blurb. Um, it's brilliant, you can find it online. I, I really, it's one of the worst books I've ever read, but it's kind of, it's kind of fascinating. Um, no, <laughs> the blurb on the back, take a look into the future. Women now rule the world, or most of what's left of it. And their world is not a pla pretty place to live in. Men have been reduced to mere chattel, good only for procreation. The feminists are working to eliminate even this strictly male function. There's so much panic about women's reproductive power in all of these books. It's a theme. Men must get permission to make love to any female, even if she is willing. Or the penalty is death. <laughs> It's uh, God. Um, in this literary disaster piece, ma male sexuality is strictly controlled and after a criminal one night fumble, our hero must go on the run, aided only by a few women who have strong feelings about the importance of mother motherhood and are uh, inc incidentally totally hot and totally up for it. All right. <laughs> What is missing from these misogynist prophecies is just as interesting as their substance. Significantly, while most of them posit a world in which women take terrible social sexual revenge for centuries of male violence and oppression, you know, ignoring all male silence, killing everyone, not one of the books denies that the violence and oppression women are reacting against actually happened. At best, they come up with exceptions that prove the rule. Um, the, the injustice is that decent men, and the protagonist is always you know, one of the decent men um, who don't hate women, uh, but they get punished collectively uh, in the name of all the non-decent men who actually do deserve it. Um, all right, so the most terrifying prospect of all is what happens when women work collectively. The idea of women organizing, sharing information and resources and coming together to change the world rather than competing for male attention as they should is terrifying enough when it's a few pink haired weirdos on the internet. The thought of what they might do with real power sends shudders through the locker room. Um, this incidentally is how we got to the point where a bloviating man child with distressing hair and an entitlement complex bigger than his unpaid tax bills is still a more conceivable president than his only nom normally monstrous opponent who happens to be female. A world with women in charge where women stand together and for each other and in any respect is not just inconceivable, but to conceive of it is an active identity threat for those whose self, sense of self has always needed a story with men on top. Okay, so right now, innovative, inciting, exciting stories by and about women, queers, and people of color are having a moment in science fiction. And so from Hollywood to the Hugo Awards, the genre's most prestigious awards, a new kind of narrative is regaining popularity, one where women and people of color get to be more than just side notes in the hero's journey. Many of the most um, important books are written by women of color. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to see those, those women writers finally you know, rising to the top of the genre. Um, and worse still, and most offensively to the alt-right, a lot of these stories have the temerity to be ob objectively brilliant. You know, they're ob entertaining enough to provoke that cognitive dissonance. You know, that it's not just enough that these stories exist, they're actually great. Um, which is what was interesting about the um, alt-right reaction to, um, to Mad Max. If you remember a couple of years ago, there was this brilliant piece which was written apparently um, with no self-awareness where the writer argued desperately saying to you know, his fellow you know, racist, sexist, you know, internet trolls, like, don't see this movie. You can't go and see this movie because it's too good. You know, it's really fun and it's fun enough that you'll get taken in. And um, the idea that you know you're just gripping your seat, trying not to enjoy it because you know it's about women and people of color, you know, actually having some agency in the future. It's bad propaganda. Um, 
you know, the patriarchal internet feels itself deeply wronged by the emergence and inexplicable popularity of stories where straight boys with guns aren't the only heroes who matter, and the backlash has been massive. For two years, anti-feminist racist pundits like Theodore Beale, who blogs as Vox Day, have attempted to rig and ruin the Hugo Awards to protest the celebration of stories that don't just involve cowboys in space. Um, Leslie Jones, who star of the female-led Ghostbusters reboot, um, was inundated with racist abuse and death threats. Hurt male pride is sparking off everywhere through modern culture and politics. It's dangerous and unpredictable as Donald Trump on the debate floor when it encounters challenges to its worldview. And this is not just, you know, an academic talk about, you know, a side fight in science fiction. You can directly trace the line of this argument right through to the new alt-right movement, the neo-Nazi movement online. A lot of it started with Gamergate. It started with the reaction against the Hugo Award. These people, these most of them young white men were politicized by anger about the emergence of these new stories in video games and science fiction and science fiction movies. Um, it's become commonplace to say that science fiction is always at least in part about the time it's written in. The 20th century was a time of seismic change in gender relations and, as and, and those stories reflect the anxieties and aspirations of their age, but so do the manner in which they were produced and read. Feminist science fiction has always been of huge literary importance within the field. Writers like James Tiptree Jr., Octavia Butler and Ursula Le Guin aren't just innovators in how they approach gender, they're innovators full stop. The stories are gripping, the language is gorgeous and the pieces stay with you. And they're also incredibly inventive, Structurally, formally, Octavia Butler does intricate things with how she just puts a story together. Um, and, but these, these writers are always overlooked, apart from Ursula Le Guin, whenever we talk about the golden age of science fiction. Why? Because there were people reading in secret whose dreams were considered unimportant, and these visions had to be written out of the broader story humanity tells itself about its desires. Over a century and more, of thought experiments. Women of all backgrounds have come up with social structures that foreground the emotional work of building and sustaining communities of survival. The very best, like Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower and the Talents, and N.K. Jemisin's recent bestseller, The Fifth Season, create drama out of the daily grind of trying to get people to work together when they're crabby and anxious and difficult. And this is key, right? I'm fascinated by post-apocalyptic or post-catastrophe fiction written by women, particularly by women of color right now. Um, a great deal of this fiction imagines society in a way that is radically different from the patriarchal literary, literary imagination, um, that it would, it would read as science fiction even without the nuclear fallout. The alt-right cannot imagine a world in which the rights of men and those of women are not opposite and antithetical, in which gains for women must by definition entail losses for men. Right, so one of the reasons it seems easier for women, queers, and people of color to come up with nuanced and diverse futures, you know, interesting futures that, um, particularly post apocalyptic futures that don't just involve rocks full, everyone dies, how will you fight your neighbors to survive? That's just, that's not, we've all read so many of those, it's not interesting anymore. What else can we do? Um, and the reason for this is that in many ways the future is where we have always lived. Women's liberation today is an artifact of technology as well as culture. Contraceptive and medical technology mean that for the first time in the history of the species, women are able to control their reproductive destiny, to decide when and if they want children, and to take as much control of their sexual experience as society will allow. So, uh, society's been slow to allow it, but that's not the sort of progress futurists get, get excited about. It has been noted that many of the so-called disruptive products being marketed as game changers by Silicon Valley startup kids are things that women actually thought of years ago. You know, food substances like Soylent and Huel uh, pushes the future of nutrition. Women have been consuming exactly the same stuff as weight loss shakes and meal replacement. You know, there was a fantastic article going around describing how this stuff is basically just a Weight Watchers or a Slim Fast shake. It's just marketed for boys and everyone's like, oh my God, let's give this guy a million dollars. He's the future of food. Um, people were using metal implants to 
to prevent pregnancy and artificial hormones to adjust their gendered appearance decades before you know, body hackers started jamming magnets in their fingers and calling themselves cyborgs. This again brings us back to Donna Haraway and the idea that women are always already cyborgs in, in this world. But what precisely is it about stories by women and people of colour, stories where civilization is built and rebuilt by humans of all shapes and flavours working together that throws water on the exposed wires of white masculine pride? It's all about humans cope, how humans cope when their core beliefs are threatened. Franz Fanon wrote, when they are presented with evidence that works against that belief, the new evidence cannot be accepted. It would create a feeling that is extremely uncomfortable called cognitive dissonance. And because it is so important to protect the core belief, they will rationalize, ignore, and even deny anything that doesn't fit in with the core belief. Um, so for all the alt-right's vaulted claims to base their reasoning on scientific opinion, most of its hand-wavy evolutionary psychology filtered through the unreality engine of mass media headline wrangling, they, they react really, really badly when actually presented with actual scientific evidence or even just evidence that people quite like the stories that they don't like. That's why they're just trying to you know, ruin things like the Hugo Awards and destroy the careers of uh, female video game designers. Um, so if you can imagine spaceships, if you can imagine time travel and you can conjure entire languages and alien races out of the wet space behind your eyes, you shouldn't have a problem imagining a society beyond patriarchy. A feminist future may be inconceivable, but it is coming nonetheless. I do believe that. It is already being written and rewritten by those who reject the Brotopian logic of late capitalism, by those who refuse to cling to the paleo, paleo futures of previous times. And um, I, I really think that that's one of the reasons that science fiction by women and people of color is one of the most important you know, political, literary and cultural in interventions that we have right now. And there's a huge push online for people to finally make films of these things. You know, the, Octavia Butler, I believe, has never really been adapted into, on the, onto the big screen because it's believed that these stories are not universal enough. Um, we're actually... Um, I really encourage um, anybody who hasn't read The Parable of the Sower and the Talents or uh, to read it right now and uh, people who have have read it to read it again because it's one of the most I, I recently reread it um it was kind of a, as as therapy while I was going around the US doing some reporting on you know what's going on over there the, the clown car pile up and um it's uh, it's massive it's one of the most interesting post-collapse books that I've ever read and I'm obsessed with these things and she imagines as um, a world in which, you know, she imagines a, the practical day-to-day -day process of rebuilding a world, recreating community, the architecture of, you know, of social, of social infrastructure. And she makes up an entire religion and is very, <coughs> very upfront about what that religion is supposed to do in society. Um, and it's, it's massively predictive. One of the things that happens in the, in the second book is they have to, um, the the emergent you know religious community has to fight against an evangelical right wing movement, which eventually uh, consolidates behind a president whose slogan is "Make America Great Again." This was written, I believe, in the eighties. Um, and uh, more lately, I think the in the inheritor of um, that you know that role as you know most exciting most important political future imaginary literary person is uh, nk jemison who's uh, whose uh, fifth season series is not quite is not finished yet but, um, but it's uh, you know a long trilogy and um, it essentially imagines a world which has to continually adapt to successive calamities and reimagine itself in the wake of that and it's a story about women doing that work and and the the, the important thing about that is that um you know it makes it a good story you know that's the story that's always missing from all these you know individual heroic white guy making a homestead on the moon you know those things are are, are you know, meant to be the most exciting story that we can imagine. But the actual work of social change is usually done 
in smaller, more you know, structural networked ways by people doing practical work on the ground. And to be able to make an exciting story out of that is a much, much more difficult prospect. And it is not a surprise to me that it is mainly women of color who have been able to do that successfully. And really, somebody needs to make the movie. I really, really want someone to make the movie. Um, can you make, you can make movies, right? You wanna make a movie? Yay! Somebody give her loads of money to make the movie. Okay, that's done, sorted. Um, and that is the end of my talk so far. I'll really, really be excited to take questions. I don't know quite how we're gonna do that if we'll take them together, but uh, thank you for listening. Thank you.